à tous. My name is Isabelle Leroux and I'm the president of the Federation of the Alliance Française USA. It's my honor to introduce today, along with the Permanent Observer for the International Organization of La Francophonie to the United Nations, Iphigenia Contoleontos, this event celebrating the Francophonie. Thank you to the team which prepared this discussion around the book French Around Us, translated in French and released today as Le Français Autour de Nous. Before starting this event, I would like to present you very quickly the Federation of the Alliance Française USA, which represents 105 Alliance Française chapters in the US only. We are the largest network in the world with an average of 25,000 learners of French every year. As you can see on the map, there is always an Alliance Française chapter close to you. We also run an online cultural program, which includes various events. In March, Chef Le Nôtre will be back with a cake recipe, and we will run an interview of author Annie Cohen-Solal for her book, Picasso the Foreigner. In April, we will have a live from France, Oliver G will present us seven things that you never did in Paris. In partnership with Bonjour Paris, our team of experts will present the part two of More Secrets of Mastering French. And I invite you to join for a new installment of our popular Paris Metro series with Charles Coulon, and we will focus on the Metro Insolite. All the information are available on our website, afusa.org. In terms of logistics, please stay on mute during the presentation, and we recommend to be on speaker view. Put your question in the chat. If you are facing technical issue, do not hesitate to log in again and to use the same link. For your information, the event is being recorded and the recording will be available on our Federation YouTube channel. It's a one hour event. The discussion to follow is fully in English, but as we celebrate today la francophonie, I will add a few words in French. Nous sommes nombreux à célébrer aujourd'hui la francophonie dans le monde. Pour les alliances françaises en particulier, la francophonie nous accompagne toute l'année dans l'accomplissement de notre mission d'enseigner le français et promouvoir les cultures francophones. À mes côtés ce soir, pour introduire cette table ronde, et nous en sommes très honorés, je donne la parole maintenant à Madame Iphigénia Contoleontos, représentante de l'Organisation internationale de la francophonie auprès des Nations unies. Bonsoir, mesdames, messieurs, chers amis francophones et francophiles. À l'occasion de la Journée internationale de la francophonie, le 1 mars, permettez-moi de vous souhaiter une journée francophone d'excellence de toutes les couleurs de la francophonie. Je remercie, pour commencer, Madame Isabelle Lowe, présidente de la Fédération des Alliances françaises des États-Unis, pour l'organisation de cet événement qui réunit la famille francophone sur le territoire américain, pour marquer cette journée célébrée sur les cinq continents dans les 88 États et gouvernements membres de l'OIF. Je voudrais aussi saluer notre partenaire de Languedin, le Centre pour l'avancement des langues, de l'éducation et des communautés, le CALEC, pour la coordination des contributions de ces remarquables ouvrages collectifs. Je voudrais remercier encore une fois sincèrement la professeure Kathleen Stein-Smith et le président du Calais, Fabrice Jomont, qui ont dirigé ce travail de main de maître. Le thème choisi cette année pour la journée internationale de la francophonie est 321 millions de francophones, des milliards de contenus culturels. Célèbre la création culturelle francophone, sa diversité, mais en même temps met l'accent sur la nécessité de valoriser l'accès au contenu culturel francophone, notamment en ligne, à l'ère du numérique, leur découvrabilité. L'OIF souhaite mobiliser ses partenaires et ses forces vives pour rappeler, à l'occasion de ce 20 mars, le principe de la diversité culturelle linguistique qui se trouve au cœur de ses objectifs et missions. À travers ce principe, cher à l'espace francophone, l'OIF met en œuvre sa coopération multilatérale dont l'objectif est de révéler la vitalité de la francophonie et de la langue française. Parmi les 321 millions de locuteurs français, nous comptons 51 millions d'apprenants du français dans le monde. 
le continent américain et les Caraïbes occupent la troisième place en matière de FLE, français langue étrangère. Le nombre total d'apprenants évolue de plus 31,7% pour la région, qui bénéficie notamment d'un accroissement très significatif de l'apprentissage du français. Selon la dernière version du rapport publié par l'Observatoire de la langue française en 2022, les États-Unis comptent 2 179 000 de francophones. Aussi, les États-Unis se classent parmi les cinq premiers pays où l'on apprend le français dans les alliances françaises en 2019. Ce pays occupe la première place en termes de nombre d'alliances françaises, 107 alliances au total. Et selon une étude de 2019, le français était classé septième langue, la plus parlée aux États-Unis. Étant donné la forte croissance démographique dans les pays membres francophones, en particulier en Afrique, nous pouvons penser que le nombre des francophones dans les grandes villes américaines est destiné à augmenter. Le French Year Language Fund, lancé par la France en 2017, a permis de lever et distribuer 1,2 million de dollars pour soutenir la création et le développement des filières bilingues francophones dans les écoles publiques américaines. L'enseignement bilingue est devenu très populaire aux États-Unis et le soutien du FDLF a permis le positionnement du français dans les cadres de cette révolution bilingue et d'enseignement des langues aux États-Unis. Donc, en 2021, 37 écoles de la Louisiane réservent une partie importante de leur enseignement quotidien en français, dont 31 écoles, 31 écoles publiques d'immersion. De façon générale, l'enseignement du français est assez stable et l'enseignement bilingue francophone est en constante augmentation aux US. Dans la perspective d'amplifier l'action de l'OIF dans la partie nord de notre continent, comme vous savez, la nouvelle représentation de l'OIF pour l'Amérique du Nord au Québec-Canada a déjà pris son envol. Cette représentation jouera un rôle primordial dans la promotion des cultures francophones sur l'ensemble du territoire américain et canadien. Un an déjà est passé depuis le lancement de l'ouvrage « French All Around Us », une œuvre unique, rassemblant les témoignages d'une vingtaine d'auteurs ayant la langue française au cœur de leur héritage culturel, mais aussi familial. À travers ce livre, nous avons eu la chance de découvrir les multiples facettes de la culture franco-américaine et les racines de la culture francophone, en voyageant de la Louisiane au New Hampshire et du Maine aux tribus amérindiennes. Je voudrais remercier les différents auteurs ayant participé à cette belle aventure, à l'écriture de ce livre, pour le partage des témoignages sur le lien étroit à la langue française aux États-Unis et, et les défis de sa sauvegarde et de sa transmission aux futures générations. Je qualifierai volontiers ce livre de clé pour mieux comprendre, appréhender, la vitalité de la francophonie que j'évoquais il y a quelques instants, sa diversité. La francophonie aux États-Unis est aussi diverse que la francophonie dans le monde. Et cet ouvrage s'est basant sur d'angles d'approche aussi bien didactiques que partage d'expériences personnelles vécues est une illustration de ce paysage très divers de francophonie évoluant dans des circonstances géographiques, historiques et sociales bien distinctes. Après le grand succès de l'édition originale French All Around Us en 2022, l'OIF a voulu valoriser cette œuvre et la mettre à disposition du public francophone en la traduisant en français. Nous sommes heureux d'avoir soutenu cette traduction et de prendre part à cet événement ce soir qui célèbre la parution de la version française, le français autour de nous. Je voudrais ici saluer la traduction de grande qualité de Madame Laura Villemin. Je souhaite une belle carrière aux Français autour de nous, qui sera présenté par le CALEC lors du Salon du Livre de Paris du 20 au 23 avril. Bon vent. Beaucoup de témoignages et de surprises vous attendent donc. Avant de céder la parole à Mme René Ketcham, présidente de l'Alliance française de Greenwich, pour entamer notre belle conversation avec les auteurs, j'ai le grand plaisir de vous présenter en quelques mots les temps forts de notre programmation du printemps de la francophonie. Alors, nous organisons ce soir, tout à l'heure, un concert à la voix francophone au lycée français de New York qui sera animé par Madame Aline Afakounoué, 
avec la participation de Hervé Coeur, artiste haïtien, et Natu Kamara, artiste guinéenne. Nous accueillerons le 25 mars la compagnie de théâtre réunionnaise Tilo 6 pour son spectacle Frénésie. Nous organiserons au mois d'avril le festival des 50 ans avec la Maison française de l'Université de New York. Nous soutenons la francophone Short Films Festival in Harlem pour sa septième édition avec une très, très riche programmation de courts-métrages. En effet, nous accueillerons également la lauréate du prix des cinq continents au mois de juin, Madame Monique Pou, pour son roman « Enlève la nuit ». Vous êtes les bienvenus à tous ces événements culturels. Célébrons ensemble le printemps de la francophonie. En vous remerciant de votre aimable attention. Merci beaucoup, chère madame. C'était un grand honneur pour vous que de vous avoir en introduction de cette table ronde. It's time now, René, to start the discussion. So, René is a board member of the Federation and she's the chair of the cultural offering for us. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. So it is my great honor to introduce, firstly, Fabrice Gilmont, who is the editor of French All Around Us and the education attaché for the Embassy of France to the United States. In addition, I'm equally honored to introduce Kathy Stein-Smith, PhD, also an editor of French All Around Us, chair of the AATF's Commission on Advocacy. Kathy is also a member of the ATA Education and Pedagogy Committee of the Mod and the Modern Language Association's Delegate Assembly. So we're going to start today with our first guest, who is joining us from Paris, Scott Tilton, for our table ronde. So Scott, Um, I think Melissa will highlight you. Um, I'd like to reference the chapter. Oh, here we go. Here we will. We'll, we'll introduce everybody at once. Well, we're going to start with Scott, who is co-founder and director of the New Foundation. We will then follow up with Joseph Dunn, director of public relations and marketing at Laura, Louisiana's Creole heritage site. In addition, we'll continue with Dr. Georgie V. Ferguson, member of the Pointe aux Chiens Indian tribe and clinical psychologist, and Dr. Catherine, Catherine, Catherine Harrington, professor of French at Plymouth State University. And then I'm not seeing the last one on the list because it's blocked out by my view. And Emmanuel, Dr. Emmanuel K. Cayembe, instructor of French and Latin and a research associate for Franco-American studies at the University of Southern Maine Franco-American Collection. Welcome, everyone. So we'll start today with Scott Tilton. Scott is, is here with us from Paris. And his book, his chapter in, in French All Around Us is Crossroads of the Francophonie. So Scott, your question today from us is if you could speak please to the importance of creativity and culture and the professional French language skills on the present and future of French in Louisiana and beyond. Please also describe the celebration of the Journée Internationale de la Francophonie at OEF headquarters in Paris that you will be attending just before our session or that you attended just before our session. Welcome, Scott. Well, thank you all so much. I, I really appreciate this opportunity. I, I would like to say thank you to the ambassador for the kind remarks. I would like to also say thank you so much to Kathy, to Fabrice for this wonderful opportunity to have written this chapter in this book and to have been you know, co-author with a bunch of different activists across the country who are doing remarkable things. I'd also like to say the Federation of the Alliance, this is wonderful to be able to work with you all in this evening. So, you know, it's wonderful. This is a great opportunity to be, I'm, I'm here in Paris. I had the opportunity to go to the OIF today uh, to participate in the Journée Internationale de la Francophonie. And right before that, I had just been in Lyon, where they were doing a wonderful conference on Louisiana to highlight our importance within the Francophonie. 
So what I'm seeing now and on this day is that we have Louisiana that is present in a lot of different domains. And this is, a, this is a great to see that we are being present, that we are part of this debate and this conversation and this community. And as we were mentioning earlier, there are 320 million uh, Francophones across the world. And in Louisiana, we are part of that community. So when I was thinking about this uh, chapter, one of the things I was thinking about is for Francophones in the United States, what the experience looks like. So I joke that sometimes the ability to live in Louisiana is the ability to have two contradicting thoughts at the same time and not have it in conflict. So the ability to be able to think about yourself as both Anglophone and, both, and Francophone, and there's no contradiction in that statement. It doesn't make you any less American. You are, that is part of your identity as an American to be Francophone within the United States. So what I wanted to highlight in the chapter was the idea that we sit at a crossroads. And this is, applies to Louisiana, but I think it applies to Francophone experience across the United States. So Louisiana, I also say often, I, I talk about New Orleans was born in the Caribbean and raised in America. You have this amazing legacy that partially is due to the, the colonialism and, and the horrors associated with it, but it's also the way that people adapted to that reality about being able to create these cultures that combined the beauty of West Africa, Europe, indigenous communities, and that that culture produced this very uniquely Francophone imprint in the United States in what we call Louisiana culture today. So thinking about that idea that if Louisiana is this creative space that we have and that we have this history, we've been able to speak three, 300 years of, French, of Francophone history in Louisiana, that it's not just a Anglophone state today, it's actually a Francophone state that has actually over time become more Anglophone. And that history is important to how we think about ourselves today and how we position ourselves as creatives. So one of the things I was thinking about in the chapter as well is that if we do think, if we kind of help recast ourselves and think of ourselves, not just as a Southern state, but if we lean into the idea that we are part of other zones, whether that's the Caribbean, West Africa, Europe, the United States, then we have this unique opportunity to be more creative in more languages. So French offers a, a great outlet for us to do that. So one of the other elements that I was thinking about in the chapter is that we're, if we are these creatives and you're trying to be able to encourage ourselves within the United States using the French language to be able to cr create more cultural production, what are some of the determinative factors that would get us there? So this is where I was thinking about one of the, so Rudy and I, Rudy Bazinet is the co-founder of my, with me of the new foundation. We had the opportunity to launch and direct an initiative that had Louisiana join the International Organization of the Francophonie in 2018. And one of the reasons why this was important is that I think it helped reshape Louisiana as thinking about itself as part of this zone of other French speaking places, but also help galvanize young people in the state to be able to want to be involved and rethink about what the French language can do for them creatively. We then went on to be able to create a cultural institute called the New Foundation, and we actually last week uh, opened, what, or about a week and a half ago, opened our cultural center in New Orleans in the French Quarter. And what this all is building up to in the context of Louisiana, but I also think more broadly across the United States, is that people are seeing, A, the value of being multilingual, and some of, the, some of those dynamics are changing about you can be American and French speaking. As I said earlier, there's no contradiction. There's also this sort of what we talked about in the chapter is that the idea of it's becoming sort of hipster in some ways. It's cool to be able to speak French and that in a context in the United States in which these type of identities are becoming more important, that it's not just about being assimilationist and going into one sort of idea, very linear view of being American, that there are more identities that are at play. We think that this is sort of the direction that we're heading in and one of the directions that the French language can head in. So I think when we're thinking about the chapter, the idea of it being a carrefour, a crossroads for the country, that being French speaking is the direction we wanna head in. And that the idea that we can, if we can encourage and build the institutions that allow young people or anyone to be creative in multiple languages, then we're heading in the right direction moving forward and we'll have a very vibrant Francophonie in the United States. Thank you, Scott, so much. Our next speaker is Joseph Dunn. Um, and Joseph Dunn's chapter in, in the book is entitled, is chapter six, it's entitled French, Louisiana's most renewable but underdeveloped natural resource, cultural tourism as a re revitalization tool for Louisiana heritage languages. So Joseph, your question today from us 
is hope if we would love it if you would speak to the importance of history and the Laura plantation on the past, present, and future of French language in Louisiana. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for putting this together. I won't repeat everything and all the remerciements that Scott already did because I uh, echo everything that he said. Um, I have worked in this field and my ideas about how we approach a French language and a Creole language revitalization in Louisiana over the years have shifted as uh, I have been more and more involved in it and working in and out of Laura Plantation since 1996. Um, I've left and come back four times, uh, so obviously it's a place that I like a lot, has really given me a lot of these insights about how to approach the ideas about Louisiana historically and contemporarily as a multilingual space where French and Creole exist in parallel, but also the idea of the diversity of these populations. So, um, for example, a lot of people are not aware that at the time of the Civil War, when the Civil War broke out, half of the population of Louisiana was enslaved. So that means that half of them were Afro-descended. So we have this uh, mosaic of populations in Louisiana Native American, uh, Euro-descended, Afro-descended, who have spoken French and Creole here since the colonial period, since 1699, before we were sold to the United States, and how, over time, those identities have shifted as uh, Americanization occurred through the 20th century, and French was... Um, replaced as the primary language of public education in schools by English as it was in Maine and in New Hampshire and in Franco-American spaces in the Northeast because there are lots of parallels there. But here at Laura, we have always taken the approach of telling of the story of this site and the people who lived here through this French Louisiana lens, which sometimes in a historical context is in conflict with the way that we learned this story in English. And uh, that echoes a lot of what Scott was saying is how can you exist in this space in English and in French at the same time and those things be contrasting but not conflictual. And they still sometimes are, I would argue, especially when we're talking about history and how we present this history because you know, our most of our visitors have never heard of Americans being called immigrants somewhere because they were immigrants into Louisiana after, after 1803. Uh, we offer tours in French here three times a day uh, at 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and 3 o'clock. Last year, 20% of our total uh, visitation was French language visitation, and it is a very vital piece of our um, of our economic model here. Uh, so we work in French. Uh, it's one of the few places in Louisiana outside of education or code of field estate agency where French is the working language of a place. Uh, now Scott and Rudy have the new foundation where they speak French. There's also the Alliance Française in New Orleans, which I say hello to. I was on the board and president of the Alliance in New Orleans and met some of you actually in New Orleans when you came for the uh, annual convention a few years ago. So um, Anyway, so coming back to this idea of, of French as an economic model, I uh, I think I'm pretty well known for this being one of my uh, cheval de bataille. This idea of French as an economic as an economic tool, um, and if we're going to make French an economic tool, that also means that we have to begin to, especially in the in the university programs, uh, see an evolution rather quickly of how French is presented to the students, not only as a language of literature and a language of philosophy, but also a language of economic development in the uh, tourism and cultural spheres, in the STEM spheres, and all of those other spaces, because my uh, chapter deals specifically with uh, French as an economic development tool that is not at all uh, developed, that is not at all uh, valorized, even within the, uh, the university sphere. Um, so at none of the hotel restaurant tourism programs in our state is there um, a course taught in French about how to work in tourism or culture, nor is a language required as um, a requirement for uh, obtaining a diploma in that discipline. So um, I think there's got to be a lot of de and de of the university programs to lead us toward that. Uh, and I think also uh, from my observation, we really need to be thinking about how we create 
spaces, as Scott was saying, uh, for French to be a, an, an economic development tool. Um, obviously, working with the OIF, working with a different uh, uh, Operateur de l'OEF, uh, those are things that we can push, but we also have to be able to create these messages in English so that we can then uh, better uh, educate the Louisiana public, we can better educate Louisiana politicians and Louisiana decision makers in the business and the political spheres about what kind of uh, what kind of economic development asset this is and how we can develop it. So thank you very much for uh, giving me a platform to speak to that. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you so much. Our next speaker um, will be Georgie V. Ferguson. Georgie, Georgie's chapter is chapter nine in the book entitled, We Are Point Au Chien. And the question is, Georgie, if you would be so kind as to speak to the significance of the maintenance of French in your community and your thoughts about the present and future of French in Louisiana and beyond. Georgie, are you muted? Hi, thank you. Yes, I was muted. Um, so those are great questions. And I think, as I talk about in the chapter, one of the things that's really important to us as Point Au is our identity. And I think that that also applies to everyone. Everyone has a sense of identity. Um, our identity is based in speaking a Indian and French language. Over the course of my lifetime, I've seen the rapid decline of French being spoken in our community. My grandparents did not speak English. My mother was born speaking English, but not allowed to speak English in school. Therefore, she spoke, not, I'm sorry, was born speaking, she spoke French in the home. So her first language was French. Did I make, did I, I my grandparents spoke French. <laughs> I don't know if I said that or not. Um, so let me be clear, let me go back. My grandparents did not speak English, they spoke French. My mother was born into a French speaking home. When she was allowed to go to school, they did not allow them to speak English. She did not speak English, but she learned. And then as the times changed and we started to interact more with people outside of our community, there was more English being spoken. I was born outside of the community and I don't speak French. I understand some French, I can read French, but that is how quickly the language has been lost. Three generations from only speaking French to not being able to speak French. Now, several of my relatives and tribal members of my generation and the generations that have come after me do speak French in the community, but I wasn't raised within the community and did not wasn't surrounded by French. So, that is one of the reasons why this is really important to me. Um, I think the second part of your question asked, what is what do I see now? And um, going back to that, now I see a community where the elders still continue to speak French. Some of them speak English um, to some degree, but prefer to speak in French and it's absolutely beautiful to see the children also speaking French. I think we have pushed really hard to have the local school, which was recently closed, um, be turned into a French immersion school. Um, however, that didn't happen in the public school system. So what I see for the future, and I think is so important is that, you know, we've started to create our own French immersion school. Um, it opens next year and it will start with kindergarten and first grade and it will be hosted in the KC Hall. And then we are going to expand from there. So that's really exciting. Um, working to sustain our language and to continue that our children, um, continue that, be, be able to have our children continue to speak the language of our grandparents and our ancestors is really important. I think that there are things that we learn in French that 
parts as a non-French speaker are really difficult to fully know because there are things you can communicate in French that cannot be communicated the same way in English. There just aren't the same words that mean the same types of things. Um, and so I think it's just really, really important, first of all, to acknowledge, you know, I really liked what Scott said about English speaking and French speaking being able to exist and not be in conflict with one another in the United States. Um, I found that being American Indian, people will say to me, um, well, then why do you want to speak French? As if that's somehow non-Indian, but they're asking you the question in English. And our ancestors spoke and got along well with people from France and French speaking communities. We shared language and that is how we have developed. We've held on to that. And that, that is something to be really proud of. And it connects us to that larger French speaking community. Um, and so I do like the way that it's been um, introduced so far by both Joseph and Scott in that they don't have to be juxtaposed. They can be celebrated. Um, and that's where we're hoping that the future will go um, for us as we begin this journey on um, developing a school for our children that is run by tribal members and community members, French speaking community members um, that even, so non-Indian students are also welcome because our community is French speaking, um, but it is an Indian French heritage language school. And it, I'm super excited about it. And, and that's, I guess, the trajectory that we're on to try to maintain um, and even grow the language and knowledge about it. Thank you, Georgie. That's so important to continue to grow the language. Our next speaker will be Catherine Harrington, whose chapter 16 in the book has the title, From France to Franco-America, Foregrounding Personal and Community Connections in the Heart of French Studies. And our question to Catherine today is, um, can you please speak to the impact of Quebec and Quebec studies on the future of French in New England? Your role as president of the ACQS, American Council on Quebec Studies, and board member of the FAC, Franco-American Center in New Hampshire. Welcome. Thanks, Renee, um, and thanks to everyone. It's also wonderful to see um, so many of my colleagues here on this call. Uh, we just heard from three people from Louisiana, um, and we're now shifting a little bit to New England. But I am um, I'm here with many of my colleagues who would have many much more to say. I'm I'm joining you um, mainly as in my role as a French educator. Um, so I've been a French professor here in New Hampshire for 13 years and before that uh, in Northern Maine for six years. I uh, followed the sort of normal trajectory of uh, French studies, uh, undergraduate, studied abroad in France, did a master's, did a PhD. Um, and in all that time, three different universities um, and three years in France, everything was that was offered to me in the study of French was based around France. And I loved it and ate it up and read, you know, tons and tons of literature um, from France. But it, it didn't occur to me till later in life when I accepted a first uh, teaching position in my native New England, but in the far reaches of northern Maine, where it was a bilingual community um, of um, Acadian descendants. And um, French was uh, represented something very, very different for my students and my community members. And now I'm in New Hampshire, where um, there's also... Uh, very strong French Canadian heritage, um, and I, you know, had to have had to really uh, think about what does French mean to my students, and um, found the need to really turn the tables around and always start by asking students, you know, what kind of what French means to them if they have heritage, if they have French speakers in their family. When I was in Maine, that was a very easy question to answer. Here in New Hampshire, at least where I am. Um, it's uh, people have a heritage, but it's not something that they're going to lead with. They're not going to tell you that it's something you kind of have to pull out of them. Um, but I've just found being you know, once again at a public university and uh, here in uh, in public education in the U.S. that the humanities are, are under attack um, and that includes languages and that very much includes French. 
Um, so I've just found the need to continually sort of justify and make relevant and forefront what is important about French and why it should be continued and why it should be studied here. Um, so, you know, creating personal connections with students and, and their family backgrounds, making, making it clear that Quebec is 100 miles um, from our campus. Uh, I'm in a place that, like Joseph, is there's um, a lot of tourism is, is the main industry here. And much of it comes from French speaking Canadians who come to our region. And yet there, there's just not this sense that we need to be reaching out and that uh, businesses should be uh, putting welcoming signs and whatnot. So I've been involved over the years in, in initiatives to you know, promote being French friendly and to having people you know, try to speak some French, even if it's just a greeting. I've done workshops um, a lot in the outdoor recreation industry for hiking um, and just encouraging people, many people who have French in their backgrounds, but for whatever reason, don't use it. So. Um, like, like Joseph, I see this as something that it is, you know, it's important for the economy, but I don't think this is something that people, uh, are, are, that they, that they know about. And so many students are taught that basically they're, everyone should learn Spanish, um, French, the numbers are declining. If I look at, I'm the, uh, president of, of the New Hampshire chapter of AATF and, um, in my time, in that role, I have seen the numbers of French programs decline, including at our university programs. So when we talk about, you know, oh, university programs should be doing this and should be doing that. Well, what I'm seeing is that even in a state that borders with Quebec that has a strong heritage, um, it's getting harder and harder to justify this. So I am trying to work um, through different roles that I have. So um, through Quebec Studies, which is a wonderful um, association of, of scholars who um, not just, you know, language and literature, but politics, film, um, linguistics and whatnot, um, they're trying to sort of bring a broader understanding of North American French, um, um, but also through the Franco-American Center uh, in, in Manchester. And I'm working on now uh, with um, support of the French consulate um, on bringing helping to bring the first French immersion program to um, New Hampshire in an elementary school, which is slated to start fall 2024. This is not uh, revolutionary for other states in the union, but New Hampshire has not had one. Um, and right now I'm working on an after school program because we're finding that public schools, they, they just have to focus on so many other things. They have these outside pressures and um, language is not a priority. So, so many of our children do not have the opportunity to start learning French or any language um, K through eight. So we're looking at innovative ways to sort of help squeeze that into the day, whether it's an after school program, a before school program, at a library, at um, a parks and rec kind of situation, and just trying to find ways to start French from the bottom up. And hopefully um, that will help populate uh, programs in high schools and in colleges, and ultimately to encourage more students to want to become French teachers to carry on the language. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And I think we all probably noted your comment about North American French and being French friendly as close as you are to the Canadian border. Our, our, our next speaker, before we hear a little bit from, from Fabrice and Kathleen, is Emmanuel Cayembe, and forgive me if I pronounced that incorrectly, but hopefully I did it correctly. Um, Emmanuel, um, your, the question that we have for you today and your chapter, let me just read the title of your chapter, your chapter two, Francophone Immigration and Questions of Identity in New England, From Multiculturalism to Cultural Diversity. And the question, is the impact of immigration from Francophone Africa on the present and future of French in Maine, New England, and the US? What are your projects at the University of Maine? Oh, thank you very much. So uh, before I get in the meat of my, my talk, I would, I would like to, to thank the Fédération des Alliances Françaises in the United of America, Dr. Jomon, and Stein Smith for inviting me to this forum. So we know that French is today a global language, a part of our identity as African. So there is a link between the history of French language and culture, 
in the US and immigration. So the first period of the history of French is linked to the foundation of uh, New France, Nouvelle France, with the exploration of Jacques Cartier and ending with the session of, of Nouvelle France, New France to Great Britain and to, to Spain. And the French that was spoken at the time was a mix up of um, standard Fran French from uh, Ile de France, that mean Paris and, and around, and some regional dialects like uh, Normand, Poitevin, Lorrain, and so on and so forth. And French had at the time a kind of ethnic, ethnic status. And the second period relating to the history of French is when almost a million of French Canadian immigrated to New England and uh, to the Midwest to seek for a well-paid job. And at the time, French was linked to the identity of all this French speaking from Canada. And then it was the language of the church and the language of household. So it was part of what we call la survivance. And to avoid to be completed, completely assimilated from American, opted for bilingual program, but fighting against borrowing from, uh, from English and from the other languages, that could be the reason why the French decline, apart from a bill voted in 1919 that forbade French from, from school. So the third, the third part of that history of French is relating to the immigration of um, African, African from a French speaking country. So many people, many observers are saying, observers are saying that African immigrants are driving French speaking Renaissance in May. So this is a momentum for us, instead of keeping borders between communities, so we need to put bridges between community and to build together a strong program of French, professional French. So we, we don't need to speak French only at home like household language, but we need to, to, to show to immigrants that that language could be an advantage in the job market. So I'm very grateful for all the job that uh, Jomo and uh, Cathy are doing about uh, the advocacy for French. And I'm ready to work with them when it comes to professional uh, French program. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our speakers. And I'd now like to give the floor to both Dr. Fabrice Jomont and Dr. Kathy Stein-Smith. Go ahead, Kathy. Okay, well, I would like to, first of all, thank everybody. And I know lots of thank yous have been said, but I'd like to really thank the organizers of today's event at the Alliance Française uh, the OIF for all the wonderful support that they have given us with this book project from the very start. And a very special thanks to Fabrice Germont and the entire team at Calec and at TBR Books for their support, for their belief in us. But this is really all about the author's stories. 
It's about the voice of the authors. You've heard them today. Um, it, their story and my heartfelt gratitude to all of the authors. It was an uh, honor and a privilege to work with all of you, including those of you I see in the chat. You're here present, but not on the panel today. Melissa Baril, Timothy Beaulieu, Elizabeth Blood, David Chorami, Melody Desjardins, Anthony Desrois, Joseph Dunn, Georgie Ferguson, uh, Catherine N. Harrington, Marie Navelle, Marguerite Perkins Justus, Emmanuel Cayembe, Etienne Kwaku, Marc Labine, Ben Levine and Julia Schultz, Jesse Martineau and Monique Martineau Cairns, Jean Murville, Jerry L. Parker, Robert B. Perrault, Scott Tilton, Agnès Tonkara, and David Vermette. Many of you are here present. I see you in, among the participants. Thank you for coming out today. And thank you to all of you, not just for the chapter in the book, for sharing your stories, of course, but for all that you do every day to advocate for, to promote, to protect, to safeguard French language and Francophone culture. Fabrice? I, I second what Kathy just said, and hearing the authors is always gives me a, a chill because they, they, their stories is so poignant. I, I'm also a, a French American. I've been here 25 years and I've raised children, and I understand the value of maintaining our linguistic heritage and transmitting our language to our children making sure that our languages are not uh, wasted or squandered. For that, of course, we need um, communities, strong communities. We need uh, schools. And I'm a big fan of bilingual education, obviously. Uh, we mentioned already uh, creating a few bilingual schools in Louisiana. Of course, we did it in New York. I'm glad this is happening in New Hampshire. Um, and in Maine, someday, I hope we will do that too. I think bilingual education is a key to sustaining our linguistic heritage um, with um, the support of um, the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie. We were able to do this translation. I have it here. I have received it, the Français autour de nous. It's, 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 it's important to have this book in French as well as we have it in English because it's important to present it to the rest of the world and, and, and explain what, what it is to be a Francophone in the United States. It's a specific identity to be a Francophone of the United States. It's very different from being Francophone of Canada or being Francophone of other countries. And But not many people know about this. And it's, it's, it's a privilege to have been part of this project and to explain to the rest of the world that we are here, we have a strong will to maintain our linguistic heritage to promote the French language in the United States. We are here to stay and we're here to build bridges. As Emmanuel said, we are here to create schools and publish books in French as well as in English. So again, congratulations to everyone. Thank you Alliance Francaise for doing this. Uh, and um, I hope many, many of you will acquire this book and support the authors. Thank you. Thank you, Fabrice. And we do have some questions in the chat, but I wanted to first thank both Fabrice and Kathleen for, for making this book available at our annual convention last year. Every Alliance Francaise who attended our annual convention received a copy of the book, read it themselves, shared it with their chapters, and, um, and really made an effort to get the word out. So we were very grateful for your generosity. So we're going to take a look. Melissa and I will take a look um, in the chat. Um, we have many merci, merci, merci. Um, thank you to the authors, many of whom are present today. Um, let me see what's next. Um, we have um, one second as I scroll down. So Andrea is asking, Andrea Loftmiller to everyone, where did you get, and I'm not, oh, here we go. Where did you get your master's and PhD, Kate? Are both degrees in French or something more specific? So Kate, you're you're muted. 
You want to know where I got my degrees from? That's the question. That's the question. Or uh, where where did you get your master's and your PhD? And are both degrees in French or something more specific? Uh, I got my master's degree in, a, in, a, in an unusual place, Texas Tech University uh, in um, French. I think it was in Romance Languages. Um, and then my PhD is from Brown University in French Studies. Thank you. So Christine Hopp to everyone is saying, I taught French for eight years at the University of New Hampshire, and we started the first France American Club there in 1990. I continue to admire the Franco-American Center in Manchester, New York, which has meetings where we can chat once a month with great Franco-Americans in Maine and New Hampshire. I'm in Virginia now. Joseph Dunn, who is one of our writers who spoke today, um, has noted in the chat that there are 5,000 students in immersion classes in Louisiana, 30,000 students in FLE, F -L -E, and 80,000 plus in Spanish. Well, we're going to change that, I think. Um, let's see here. And if I might, Renee, what the reason that I put that in there is just for a reference point, because Kate and others have addressed the idea about um, the humanities being under attack in not only the universities, but also K-12 programs where everything is moving towards STEM. And we actually had a law passed in Louisiana last year, Act 502 of the Louisiana legislature, which is allowing high school students to replace their language credits with coding credits. Okay. So, um, and what that is going to do is further, I think, eviscerate French as a second language programs in high schools because they will keep Spanish because it's a language of consumerism. They will install coding and they will cut French because we don't have an idea even in Louisiana that French is quote unquote useful. And so uh, my idea has always been that if we are creating jobs in French and showing that French is a language of consumerism, then we can then flip that backwards into promoting it as a language for uh, we we can defend keeping it as a language in our in, in our schools universities as well, and I think uh, across the country that is probably going to be a coming trend. So I'll go back to mute. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at we have an, a long comment here from David Vermet. He says um, to everyone, the largest cohort of French descent and historically Francophone people in the U.S. is the two million French Canadian and Arcadian descendants in the six state New England region. One third of the essays in the book address this population, and yet none of the descendants of this historic community in New England is represented on this panel. I find this troubling. It tends to amplify the historic invisibility of this community, a community which is little understood by people from outside the region. We have Kate and Dr. Kayembe talking about us, but our voice is not heard on this panel. We can't build bridges without acknowledging the largest community of Francophone and Francogene people in the US. I think that, that question could be open to anybody on the panel. Emmanuel, I think your hand was up first. You're muted. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, um, I'm very happy to hear this for, from, uh, from David. So um, David Vermet is a um, brilliant researcher. And I think that he's on the list of my speakers, next speakers in our uh, campus of Portland, instead of talking in Lewiston, that is a very small uh, city. So I wanna invite him to Portland to talk with academics and, and students in the days to come, yeah. Kathy, I saw you had your hand up as well. Yeah. You know, I, I read David's comment and I have to say, I read his book, A Distinct Alien Race. It was one of the most wonderful books, heartbreaking, not easy to read, but a wonderful, wonderful book. As a reader, um, I lived in Quebec for about six years when I was going to school. Um, and that was really what 
encouraged me to continue my childhood interest in French. So, you know, I, I am reading what he's saying about 2 million French Canadians and Acadian descendants in the US. Now, um, I will say on previous panels, um, I know um, there was a panel um, at the OIF, um, Jesse Martineau, who is um, the creator of the French Canadian Legacy podcast, was one of our panelists. And I know there have been other panel discussions um, and you know, not there are over 20 authors of this book. And, um, you know, I think it would be great to hear from David, from Jesse, from Tim Beaulieu, from Melody Desjardins, from Robert Perot. Now, Robert Perot and David and Melody, as well as Catherine, were all on a panel about this book that we had presented at the Franco-American Center in Manchester. It was a hybrid panel. Some of us were in person, and I think Kate and David were on Zoom. And so David actually has been included in panels, and I look forward to seeing all of the authors in our panels. We really do have to keep talking about this topic, and the more voices are better. I'm often teased by Fabrice that one of my favorite expressions is l'union fait la force, but that is absolutely true. We need all our voices. Thank you, Kathy. We have a few more questions here. Cindy is asking, is the spoken French in both Quebec and Louisiana closer to entre guillemets, old French? I have been told that it is, but not sure. I don't know who would like to respond to that. Joe? Can I jump in with that? Because we spend a lot of time talking about that in Louisiana specifically. What if you listen to the varieties of English that have been spoken on this panel today, we all understand each other because we are constantly exposed to varieties of English. I think in my observation that people tend to fixate on these quote unquote differences in French without looking at their similarities. So if you can sit in front of a television and watch Harry Potter or watch Downton Abbey, um, and you're from somewhere in the United States, that's because you've been exposed to those varieties of, of English. So coming back to what Kate said, coming back to what Kathy has said, coming back to what Claire Marie Brisson says all of the time, she's not in this panel, we have to do a better job exposing people to varieties of, of French that are not metropolitan, that are not singing around the Eiffel Tower, uh, because these varieties exist. And if we can train our ears to uh, understand English, we can also train our ears to understand varieties of French. So uh, I, I think we have to look at it from a different perspective, not look at it as a question of differences, look at it as a question of similarities and how we can do a better job of exposing ourselves and others to these varieties of French. Thank you so much. Well, I'd like to thank everyone. Um, we're coming to the end of if, of, our, of our time together. And I just, I just as, as moderator, I, I would really worked hard on doing my homework and reading this book. And, and I just wanted to conclude, and if there are any comments, that's wonderful, but, but we've answered all the questions in the chat. And in just in reading this book and in reading all of your chapters, I think that, that you know, I can speak for the Federation, I can speak to all of us who are French teachers or presidents of Alliance Francaise uh, in the 105 Alliance Francaise um, in, this, in the country, that, that we all need to really regard the French language in the US as a renewable asset. And I think that's a word that one, all, one of you used. I didn't, I didn't make that up myself. Um, and a renewable asset validating our French heritage while not placing French in opposition to English and or, or not giving it this level of exclusivity that I think can be sort of unfortunate from time to time. Um, in an American arena of dominant um, monolingualism, which is of course a word that you've all used in one way or the other, French is an investment. And I think we all look at, like, look at it as an investment in an essential skill that will allow us all in this crazy world that we live in right now to be global citizens. Um, we're isolated in this country um, and anything that we can do to, to, to become this global citizen, if it's through French, what a luxury. So I'm very, very honored to have been able to moderate. Right 
program. And um, I wanted to thank Isabel um, and thank um, everybody who joined us today and specifically thank Fabrice and Kathleen. And I hope everybody buys the book. So please, before you sign out, make sure you take a look in the chat. There's a link to where you can buy both the book in English and it came out today in French. And I just wanted to thank everyone. And I don't know if Isabel wanted to say a final thank you as president of the Federation, but- um, Yes, thank you, and a big thank you to all the participants. We were really a lot on the Zoom today, so it's a good news for the French language. And also a big thank you to Madame l'Ambassadeur for being with us, because I can see that I know she's in Europe and she's still with us tonight. So thank you so much for your participation as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank and you. I hope to see you soon because we have more events to come in March. So thank you all. Goodbye, everyone.